Good morning. I welcome you all to the 36th Annual National Prayer Breakfast. And before I introduce to you the fine group of men behind me, I'd like to uh, first thank Congressman Bob Stump for his beautiful pre-breakfast prayer and to thank him also for his leadership in the House Prayer Group. They're telling me that it's not on. Somebody turned it on for us. Not on. Well, we'll get it on. Got a dead mic. Got a dead mic. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I don't think so. Is it still off? Yeah, I don't. Good morning, good morning. Yeah. Can you, uh, yes. Good morning. We now have a microphone that works. I want to welcome you to the 36th Annual National Prayer Breakfast. And before I introduce the uh, fine group of young men behind me, I want to thank Congressman Bob Stump for his beautiful pre-breakfast prayer. We're still off. We're having a little problem with our mic and we'll get it worked out. you again and begin by thanking Congressman Bob Stump of Arizona uh, for our pre-breakfast prayer uh, and the Wheaton College Men's Glee Club uh, for a wonderful beginning of this fine day. Let's give them a hand. We're just... <laughs> for our opening prayer, I want to present Admiral William J. Crowell chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a man whose uh, distinguished career spans from as a young naval aide to President Eisenhower. And President Eisenhower was our president at our first national prayer breakfast to hold the highest job in our military, but also a man who has always recognized a need for prayer and divine guidance. Admiral Crowell.
Thank you, Senator. Good morning. Uh, you can't see yourselves, but I want to ensure you that you're a very inspiring sight. The National Prayer Breakfast began in 1953 as a gathering of our government's leaders, and I understand it was organized by President Eisenhower and a number of his friends in the Congress, whom had, over the course of a lifetime of service, found strength in a relationship with God. <clears throat> Together, they desired to make a conspicuous renewal of their dedication to the principles <clears throat> of their faith. Now, this is an institution, and it, has, it represents an honored place in our national life the National Prayer Breakfast. There is a corridor in the Pentagon dedicated to President Dwight Eisenhower's memory. It's just outside the office of the Secretary. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we have come together this morning to reaffirm our dedication to your teachings. We still strive to give your commandments life in our time. We still yearn for that peaceful concert of peoples, that order of justice and liberty, in which all men can pursue their rightful aspirations in tranquility. We still seek that unity in which all can share in the world's bounty. <clears throat> we know these things are the heart's desire and the birthright of every individual on earth. Grant us the wisdom to see the way to these ends through clouds of division and discord. Make us strong against worldly weaknesses and vigilant to find and redress our own shortcomings. Help us to see your image in others and to understand their ways of serving and searching for your path. Let all understand that to serve you is to hasten the day when nations without exception shall lay aside rivalries and feuds and embrace one another as brothers. This we ask on behalf of all your children and in your name. Amen. Now, if you will allow me to introduce a few people who, although do, they do not appear on your program, are very significant to all of us, especially those of us at the head table. And if uh, you will stand as I introduce you, uh, from my left, uh, Shirley Crow, the wife of Admiral William Crow, Ms. Crow, Bill, uh, together with Ellen, his uh, wife, uh, have been Senator Bill Armstrong. Thank you, Lawton. Thank you for your uh, generous words. Far more than I deserve. I sure wish you'd been with me in Cortez, Colorado the other day, though. In Cortez, Colorado, instead of getting a wonderful introduction like that, the person who was preparing to introduce me arose and began to ramble through a lengthy, disorganized introduction, and it finally occurred to him, Lawton, as he was uh, speaking, that at some point in my life I had been interested in a particular obscure portion of the tax code. And he began to explain the tax code to this audience. And he got about three or four minutes into it, and it finally dawned on him that this was getting completely off the rails. And he stopped and he said, if I try to tell you any more about this, I'm just going to make a fool of myself, and I don't want to do that. But Senator Armstrong will. <laughs> Thank you, Lawton. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, Mrs. Reagan. Mr. Secretary, Admiral, distinguished guests, my colleagues, what a great morning. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. This is a very, very special time for Ellen and me, and, and I really believe for our country and for all of the nations that are represented here this morning. And I want to join my colleagues in welcoming you to this unique gathering in a spirit of friendship, in a spirit of brotherhood, and in the spirit of Jesus Christ. As I look out into the audience, I see so many distinguished lawyers, I almost hate to bring up a legal issue, but I can't help recalling a uh, particular lawsuit. It wasn't, uh, Howard, it was not a great issue of Constitution. <laughs> Some of you in the room uh, knew Dr. Charles Malik, who passed away recently. The important thing, and the reason why I don't want to dwell on my own experience is that it is
wonderful, wonderful message. Mr. President, this is the eighth prayer breakfast that you have participated in. And in the 36 years of this event, no president uh, and his lady have been more faithful in their participation or more helpful uh, in all of the events surrounding the, uh, the breakfast, the, the meeting and the uh, greeting and entertaining of our foreign guests and dignitaries than you and Mrs. Reagan. And we wish to extend to both of you our sincere gratitude for that. And now I present to you the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, and thank you all very much. You know, hearing these wonderful young men from Wheaton College here took me down memory lane a little bit because some years ago, before they were born, and well, possibly before some of their fathers were born, <laughs> uh, I played football against Wheaton College. Uh, and it's kind of nice that I can say here, if one of them asked me, it ended in a tie game. Uh, at the risk of sounding facetious, I just want to say here in this room, when, as has been so eloquently stated, by the people who've spoken already about the uniqueness of how all of us and from so many different heritages have come together here in the name of that one man. I have long been un unable to understand the atheist in this world of so much beauty. And I've had an unholy desire to invite some atheists to a dinner and then serve the most fabulous gourmet dinner that has ever been concocted. And after dinner, ask them if they believed there was a cook. <laughs> well, I want to thank each of you for being here today and for sharing with us the spiritual message that God has placed in your hearts. God's love shines through every word. His truth is the ultimate power source, and it's always there. It's available to ministers of the gospel, presidents, and the local grocery clerk. His comforting hand, uh, well, I could never carry the responsibilities of this high office without it. Our fourth authors drew on the wisdom and strength of God when they turned a vast wilderness into a blessed land of plenty called the United States of America. God has truly blessed this country, but we never should fall into the trap that would detract from the universality of God's gift. It is for all mankind. God's love is the hope and the light of the world. Recently, a letter found its way to my desk I'm pleased to say, and in that letter was a copy of a prayer. It was sent to me by a woman who had lost her husband in World War II. This prayer had been written and delivered in a shell hole during World War II. It read, Hear me, O God, never in the whole of my lifetime have I spoken to you, but just now I feel like sending you my greetings. You know, from childhood on, They've always told me, you are not. I, like a fool, believed them. I've never contemplated your creation. And yet tonight, gazing up out of my shell hole, I marveled at the shimmering stars above me and suddenly knew the cruelty of the lie. Will you, my God, reach your hand out to me, I wonder? But I will tell you, and you will understand. Is it not strange that light should come upon me and I see you 
amid this night of hell. And there's nothing else I have to say. This, though, I'm glad that I've learned to know you. At midnight, we are scheduled to attack, but you are looking on, and I am not afraid. The signal. Well, I guess I must be going. I have been happy with you. This more I want to say. As you well know, the fighting will be cruel, and even tonight I may come knocking at your door. Although I have not been a friend to you before, still, will you let me enter now when I do come? Why, I'm crying, O oh God, my Lord. You see what happens to me. Tonight, my eyes were opened. Farewell, my God. I'm going, and I'm not likely to come back. Strange, is it not? But death I fear no longer. And he did not come back. This prayer was found on the body of a young Russian soldier killed in action in 1944. I also received some letters, five letters in fact, from Russian soldiers in Afghanistan who had deserted their government and their army. Each one of them wrote a letter to me and in that letter revealed their belief in God and that they had deserted not out of fear of battle but because they could not carry out the unholy orders that had been given them. And just last week, one of those five, we did get them out. Their plea was for sanctuary. One of those five was in my office, a handsome young man in his early 20s. And it was evident, and not from only from his letter, but from his words, that when he was thanking me for what we had done, that uh, he believed in God and I asked him what, how much of what he felt, how much religion did he believe there was in his own country. And he said, well, among young people like myself, it is spreading fast. So I know with all of us here and brought together, as we've been told so often to, to this morning, in his name, I just Thank you. God bless you all. about to be blessed by a woman with a beautiful voice and heart. Happy birthday, Mr. President. Happy birthday to you. Now we're about to be blessed with a woman with a beautiful voice and heart. Patricia Born, Barnes was born and raised uh, here in Washington, D.C., and she's dedicated uh, her heart to sing of Christ's love uh, for those of the center city. She often sings for the benefit of the homeless and the needy and for those in prison. Today, as Pat sings, Great is Thy Faithfulness, we are reminded of Christ's abiding love for each of us and singing the closing song and then leading us together in one stanza of amazing grace, Patricia Barnes. so specially blessed this morning with many, many 
special guests, many godly men and women, and coming to close us with a few words of prayer as a man that's known to all of us. He's a teacher, he's an encourager, he's a proclaimer of truth, a man of prayer, and a man of God. And we're told that uh, God does not raise up a prophet uh, today, but I think we know that if he did, he'd look like Billy Graham. President Reagan, Mrs. Reagan, Senator Giles, Senator Armstrong, distinguished guest. It's been my privilege to be here at every prayer breakfast since the very beginning, except two. And that was when I went out to speak to troops and when they were fighting out in other parts of the world. And I was here that first one. And I think I've given the message here about 12 or 15 times. So I've been a part of this prayer breakfast, and now I've been here so long, they don't know how to drop me. <laughs> and uh, so I'm here again. But of all the prayer breakfasts that I have been to, this one, I believe, has honored Christ more than any that I can remember. And I keep saying that. And since this is the last uh, breakfast, the prayer breakfast that President and Mrs. Reagan will be in their official capacity, I would like to take this opportunity again to thank them for the wonderful messages that he has brought since being here. And this morning was one of the best he has brought, maybe the best, and we're very grateful. And the moral and spiritual leadership, Mr. President, that you have given the country and the example you and your wife have set in teaching what love and loyalty between husband and wife can be, has been a tremendous inspiration to us. And Mrs. Reagan, I want to thank you for the many projects you have instigated and especially your emphasis on fighting the terrible evil of drugs in this country. George Washington was our first president, the first commander in chief who led the revolution. And without him, there might have never been an America. He was a man of deep faith. And when he left home, his mother told him, remember that God only is our sure trust. My son, neglect not the duty of secret prayer. He never forgot her words. And as a young man, he began to keep a little diary in which he recorded his private prayers. And in that little volume, he wrote these words. O oh, most glorious God, I acknowledge and confess my faults and sins. Direct my thoughts, words, and work. Wash away my sins in the immaculate blood of the Lamb. And purge my heart by the Holy Spirit. Daily frame me more and more into the likeness of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Thou gavest thy Son to die for me, and hast given me assurance of salvation. Upon my repentance and sincerely endeavoring to conform my life to his holy precepts and example. We've heard this morning that same message that George Washington wrote in his little book because George Washington and some of those early founders of America were firm believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the fact we need to repent of our sins and turn by faith to him, and they did that.
We hope you'll participate in all the other events, and thank you for being here this morning.